Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is Leonard Schlein, who is a surgeon, writer, inventor, architect, and just general all-around Renaissance man. He uh, was chairman of laparoscopic surgery at the California Pacific Medical School and an associate professor of surgery at UCSF. He has written three bestsellers, uh, Art and Physics, Parallel Visions in Space, Time, and Light, The Alphabet versus the Goddess, The Conflict Between Word and Image, and sex, time, and power, how women's sexuality shaped human evolution. Dr. Schlein, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Where were you born and raised? Um, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I uh, um, left there when I was uh, an intern, came out to California, and had my mind blown by all the opportunities that were in California <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. I promised my father that I would go return, and I did uh, after my internship. And then uh, I left for Bellevue in New York and, and then transferred back out to California and have been here ever since. And, and let's go back to your childhood a little. Looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, I had a very um, conventional upbringing, um, I don't think that uh, they uh, um, influenced my wide range of thinking. My father never understood me. Uh, he, he, he was focused in his work and I was all over the place, so, so uh, we never really quite understood each other. Um, and my mother was um, a very easygoing and loving human being. So. Uh, but I don't know where I uh, obtained this uh, wide range of interests. What was there uh, in your uh, childhood a lot of museum attendance, no. uh, a lot of book reading? No. So uh, you, you start uh, a new tradition in your family. Exactly, exactly. And what, what about I, in— I mean, I never saw my father read a book. Uh -huh. Never. He read the financial pages, and he, but he never read a book. And my mother read um, uh, romance novels. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so so what do do you uh, what do you attribute the path that you took to just the envi different environments you were exposed to? I can't attribute it to anything. I just I just know that I'm. I was unusual. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about uh, your your uh, uh, secondary uh, your, your your high school education? Any teachers that really influenced you, or I were was, you? I yeah. was very young. Uh, my father was pushing me through school, so I graduated high school when I was 16. And 16 is um, a lot different than 18. So I was, you know, somewhat immature and. Uh, and kept to myself and did a lot of reading and um, so I don't know whether that that contributed to it. And college, where did you get your undergrad, do your undergraduate work? Well, I, I, um, I went to University of Michigan and, and um, found that I loved it and that's when I became aware that um, I was pretty smart. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, because I was competing with all these um, other kids. And then I got accepted to medical school at the age of 19 uh, to Wayne State University. And I applied out of my junior year, and University of Michigan told me that they would accept me if I waited a year and um, applied when I was 20. But uh, my father uh, said, you know, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. Mm -hmm. So you're going to Wayne State University. So I, um, I um, uh, am, am going there. I, I went there, and um, and it's been. Um, and then I, you know, I left and I came out to California. Uh, go back to your undergraduate education. What did you major in? Did you did you say? I, I didn't have time to major in anything I because see. it was a three year. Yeah, okay. You know, it's three years jammed into four, 
So I had to take all these science courses. You know, it was basically a pre-med. I mean, it was uh, I see. Got all, you, yeah. all, all science. And, and, and when did you know you wanted to be a doctor? My father looked between the slats of the crib when I was two years old. And said, <laughs> I said, "You're going to be a doctor." I see. So, so no reading, just just career planning. Uh, and in medical school, what uh, what what interest did you have? I mean, you're you're. Well, I, I was very interested in psychiatry. I always thought I wanted to be a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and I applied. You know, that, that, that's all I talked about. You know, and. And um, and at that, you know, you have to appreciate that this is the time of the 50s and the 60s when Freud was so popular, and um, and I remember flying out from <laughs> when, when I finished the army. Uh, I was in the army for two years, and I finished it. And the army will fly you anywhere in the world for free on the last day you're in the army. So I flew from Paris to San Francisco. And being inexperienced and young, I didn't realize how long that was going to take. And I arrived um, in, still in my uniform and drove right to the mm -hmm. to the uh, UC and and was in a terrible shape. And and the woman said, "You're late." <laughs> and and I um, and I got interviewed by two men who came um, just did the most complete interviews for psychiatry, and then. Afterwards, I just was so exhausted. Uh, I started to cross the street, and and I I just remembered how wonderful it would be to cross the street and not get run over, because in France you would get run mm -hmm. over. And I started to um, cross the street, and a driver came down a little Volkswagen and started honking at me, mm -hmm. and I flipped him off. And mm -hmm. then he did it again, and I flipped him off again. And then he stopped the car and he got out of the car and he, and he, it was the guy that just interviewed me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so that wasn't that wasn't wonderful. So, so he 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 said that he wanted me to start the um, that he had consulted the other guy and they wanted me to begin in in a week. And I said, well, I I can't get started in a week. I'm getting married. He said, I'll give you two weeks. And I was applying for the following spring, you know, and I said, Jesus, I said, well, you know, and I was so hesitant. So I ended up, um, he was very annoyed and got back in his car and he said, you know, you decide when you want to be and you let me know. And, mm -hmm. he, and he drove off. And I thought to myself, you know, uh, something in my life has changed. And I ended up um, getting married and then uh, going on my honeymoon. To New York, and and I was confused about what I wanted to be, and I went into the Department of Surgery and asked for some information, and they said, well, this guy interviews for the persons from out of town, and uh, Dr. Dumont. So I, I interviewed with him, and I didn't know that it was an interview. And then he said, and this was during the Vietnam era where mm -hmm. people were getting drafted, you know. So he said, well, he said, uh, if, if, if your transcript is correct, uh, we want you to start in, in a week. <laughs> I said, no, I can't start in a week. I, I'm on my honey. I said, well, you start in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, well, this, you know, so you had many oppor opp opportunity <laughs> doesn't, uh, you know, ring twice. So I came back to the hotel and I, my wife at that time wanted to live in New York. And I said, well, would you like to live in New York? She said, yeah. Be it, do it, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, I haven't told you what it is. It's uh, I'm going to be a surgeon. So, so I went from the West Coast at Langley Porter in psychiatry to the East Coast at Bellevue, which is, mm -hmm. couldn't be much more different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and when I was when I was studying psychiatry, I was learning how the mind works, and then I began in vascular surgery. And I had to understand how the brain works. Mm -hmm. So, so I became very interested in right brain, left brain, you know, because you know you're, you're driving to work in the morning as a surgeon, and you're mulling over what you're doing that day, and you're thinking, let's see now, is that a is that a, a, a right sided hernia or a left sided hernia? <laughs> you know, and, and you know you don't want to make that ever make that yeah. mistake. You know, I, I've never have and. 
with um, with vascular surgery, there's an added mix because you need to know is the person right-handed or left-handed mm -hmm. because operating on the right or left carotid produces different things if they're right-handed or left-handed. Mm -hmm. So I always thought that was very odd. Mm -hmm. So I combined my um, right brain, left brain interest in the way the brain works with my interest in psychiatry about the way the mind works and I've written these three books that and now I'm writing a fourth um, that all have kind of a subtext of right brain, left brain to it. But before we get to that, because I am really interested in the forces that shaped you during this odyssey that we've described thus far, were you a, a, a person reading everything? I mean, I uh, obviously you were given opportunity, and obviously you seem to have had a, a candle power that was recognized very early, but but w w were, you, were you reading in all fields in this it's, early it, It's amazing. I, I, uh, I came out here from Detroit, and in Detroit everything was Freud, and when, when I got out here everything was Jung, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and I, I became very interested in Eastern philosophy, and I remember my former wife used to say, God, you know, you, re you really read weird books, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I, they were all grist for the mill. I mean, it just all became, mm -hmm. Uh, part and parcel of what I wanted to convey um, to my audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so in a way, in thinking about the brain and the mind, you had a lot to work with right. in terms of what was going on in 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 your own uh, head. Now, you you you're most importantly a writer and you're a surgeon. I, I want to uh, ha have you give us, before we talk about what you've written, a sense of what is involved in two of these several vocations that you have. Being a surgeon, what, what, what does it take? What are the skills involved? What is the terrain you're mapping? You have to be powerfully concentrated. And uh, I started out as a vascular surgeon, um, and I did that for about 25 years, a gen general and vascular. And then this new opportunity came along uh, with laparoscopic surgery. And I became one of the pioneers in this field and devoted my energies to developing pi uh, laparoscopic surgery to the point that I'm the chairman of laparoscopic surgery at my hospital. And and laparoscopic surgery required an entirely new way mm -hmm. to uh, visualize, because you know, you're operating off a screen and you're operating with very long instruments. And um, Because and you're, you're using a screen because you're using a camera-like device correct. to see where you, you're, right. you're right. acting. Yeah. So it's completely, I mean, there's never been in a hundred years a a development like laparoscopic surgery that's completely transformed uh, the the, uh, the operation that we perform, and um, and as a result of this, I, I began to invent instruments for this particular kind of surgery, and then I was teaching courses and training surgeons, and then I was going up and down the coast of California, setting up about 30 community hospitals, and then. Um, I was invited to Japan and, and other places to, to, to teach this kind of surgery. So all, while all that was going on, I also had mm -hmm. the new book coming out um, uh, of art and physics, which, so I thought to myself, Jesus, what, what, why couldn't I, why couldn't this be sequenced? I mean, mm -hmm. why, do, why, do they, why do these things both have to happen at the same time? But, but I, I want to go back. Let's get you back to just the surgery before you were using right. the technology. What, what, if a student were watching this program, what, what, they, which, what, what are the skills? What, what is it that you have to be like uh, and have to know in order to do that well? Well, for, first of all, you had to be very right-brained mm -hmm. because um, I built a house 
and I worked with an architect and we realized I would go over to his house and describe the kind of operation I did and then he would describe and, and I realized that we're three-dimensional thinkers you know um, as opposed to that is brain surgeons yes, yeah as, as opposed to two-dimensional thinkers that that's the way most people are I mean uh, I would show the plans to, to people and they couldn't understand or I draw the, a, a drawing of what I did in an operation they couldn't get it but when when you're a surgeon and you're you're looking in the bottom of a wound you have to know and visualize what's ahead of you what's behind you what's to the side of you and um, you know the most dangerous word in surgery is not whoops I mean whoops just simply means you got something that's uh, out of control the most dangerous word in surgery is hmm mm -hmm. because because hmm means what the hell where where am i you know i, I mean what's happened here why is bio leaking out mm. of this so, so, so it's a, it's a sense of design and of space, yeah. and but but unlike an architect, you're actually moving through time, right? I mean, because you 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 constantly have to re -can, rethink where right, you are and right, what you're doing. Right. Yeah. So, so you have to have a very good three dimensional brain, um, which um, uh, and, and I was you know I, I was. Um, um, it came easy to me, you know. So, so in that respect, um, that that's my right brain. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. that, that's the skill of the right brain. And and you know, most surgeons are not particularly expressive, and um, you know, they're they're right brain people. Mm -hmm. And you, all, I, I guess, you have to have a lot of courage too, don't you? Or does it develop over time? I mean, and you you have to be have willing to, to go places. You that, have to have courage. I mean, it's. I'm glad that you brought that up because surgeons, um, you, you, there comes a moment in an operation when you have to make a decision and you have to make a decision to go for it or to not go for it. If you're going to try to take a tumor out, you may not find out to the very end that it's unresectable. So there's, so there comes, there's a lot of courage involved. And self-confidence. And self-confidence. Mm -hmm. right. Now, now, in in moving from just being a surgeon to uh, being a pioneer in the development of a new kind of surgery, uh, that's a that's a kind of an interesting leap, because you're you're secure being a regular right. surgeon. Right. But and and I guess what, what I'm curious about, and and in this this new kind of surgery you were doing, which you've explained to us. You, you're actually been a, a successful inventor right. of new technologies to use. So tell me about that that leap. Does that that innovativeness doesn't come naturally to every surgeon? Well, I, I uh, it, it, you know, laparoscopic surgery was embraced by young people, and I was one of the oldest mm -hmm. people in that group. You know, um, uh, whenever we went on a tour or was invited somewhere as I would always, I'd always look around and I think to myself that I'm the oldest person here, you know. And, you know, I, I adopted it uh, in March and UCSF didn't do their first uh, uh, laparoscopic procedure till August. You and, know? and in what year was this? This would have been? 1990. You know? 1990, yeah. And, and it, it really took, it took medicine by storm because, you know, this was an industrial, Medical complex that was pushing these machines and 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 it didn't come. It, it, it was invented by a man who wasn't part of a university, you know. Mm -hmm. So this this sort of was a counter movement um, from the private sector to the public se to the uh, university sector, and this is the first like that's the first time that that ever happened, or maybe you know I'm I'm not quite sure, but. You know, most things come from the universities, but um, uh, this was uh, th this was a different kind of um, movement. Mm -hmm. So, what did it take to be able to embrace a movement when you're the oldest guy in the bunch? Well, I I um, I never thought of myself as an oldest guy. In the bunch. <laughs> okay. And and I I remember um, that my malpractice uh, insurer 
said that uh, it would be improper for me to go train these guys in uh, all these communities because it would be called itinerant surgery. If you weren't following the patient, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you could be accused of malpractice. And I said, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. I mean, I, well, how are we ever going to get this started? So I, I just ignored this rule and went to all these other communities and taught them how to do surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in, in, in this movement from one kind of surgery to another, are you, are you then drawing on other qualities in your brain when you make this left-right distinction, or are we still in the same realm of the brain? Well, I, I think that um, this requires another step back from what you would see when you're looking at a wound, mm -hmm. because now you're looking at a screen and you have two instruments that are going in and when you want when you want your instrument that you're seeing on the screen to go up you have to put your hand down mm -hmm. when you want your instrument to go right you have to put your hand left but when you want your instrument to go in you have to put it in mm -hmm. so you have two movements that are contrary and one that's the same mm -hmm. so that means that a complex three-dimensional movement is um, very difficult for anybody to learn because you have to retrain your brain. And I've seen surgeons just break out in a sweat trying to learn hmm. how to do this, you know, because it's not, it's not intuitive, it's not simple, and it takes uh, experience to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that probably the kids playing the video games today, you know, will be uh, huh. uh, pretty att attuned to this. But you know, we all started out having to learn this, and to this day, I mean, there's some guys that have a total knack for it, and some people that just don't get it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the. Uh do you have a photographic memory, or is it, or is is that not the way to understand qualitatively what you seem to be able to do? It's not a photographic memory. Yeah. It's just, it just it it just means that it just means that you have a um, holistic view of mm. of the whole thing. Mm hmm. And, and in this new kind of surgery with this technology, what, what, what are you operating on? You're operating on the midsection or? Well, you, 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 it, it's mainly um, chest and, and, um, um, and abdomen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've done lung biopsies. I've done gallbladders. I've taken out uh, spleens. I've, mm -hmm. You know, so... But now it's it's getting into all kinds of things, and and this is spreading uh, to become a, a very useful tool in surgery. Now, uh, hands are very important also in surgery, uh, correct? Yes. Yeah, and it, it uh, as you describe this, and as I think about this, it there there are elements of being an artist in being a surgeon. Well, is that, I, is I've that always, right? I, I've always maintained that surgeons are not technicians, they're not mechanics, mm -hmm. they're artists. You have to make a series of artistic decisions that, um, that, that are made intuitively. I mean, you can't, you can't follow, you, you can follow the mechanics, uh, you know, going down the list, but there comes a time when you have to use an artistic vision. So. And, you know, I said this in my book, you know, because um, people said to me, well, how could you write a book about art and physics? Because you're not an art historian and you're not mm -hmm. a physicist. But on the other hand, I think that surgeons are um, trained to be artists. And at the same time, they have all the science background to be a physicist. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, before we talk about the ideas you've pursued and how they've come from this, um, you're a writer. So, so the the and a and a and a best-selling 
uh, author who's covered a number of fields. So, so what, what, what does it take to do the kind of writing that you do, the, the skills that are involved? I, I, talk a little about that. Well, I, I um, you know, the most I ever wrote was in a progress note. <laughs> And Before progress, you started doing the and, books. And progress notes are not, you know, literary masterpieces. Mm -hmm. And doctors are not known for not <laughs> right. writing with clarity. Yeah, so, so I, I, um, I just developed, uh, I, well, what happened is I had a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in, when I was age you 37. You were ill, yeah, yeah. 37. And um, I recovered from that, and that was 1974, and Kubler-Ross wrote her book, Death and Dying, and the country was grieving and for Watergate and Vietnam, and, and somebody invited me to this conference in Berkeley uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to, to sort of uh, give, a, give a talk on, on, the, on the fact that I was a, um, a, a, um, a brain know, surgeon? No, you'll have to forgive me because I'm just had brain surgery. Yeah. So, um, but you'll have to. Um, they 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 wanted me to be um, a, a surgeon who spoke from the American College of Surgeons, from the American Cancer Society, and then I was a patient, so mm -hmm. I had to give those two points of view. Mm -hmm. So I gave a talk. And a guy came up to me afterwards, uh, Charlie Garfield, and he said, Jesus, this was just wonderful. Uh, do you have this written down? And I said, well, you know, I don't, you know. So he said, well, I'd like you to be in a book that I'm writing or I'm editing uh, with uh, Linus Pauling and Hans Selye and, and Fran, uh, uh, Norman Cousins and Carl Menninger. I said, sure. Hmm. So uh, I wrote this chapter out and then people started contacting me about the chapter, you know, and I thought, well, gee, it's something I wrote actually affected people. So then uh, the publisher came to me and said that they wanted me to expand this book into a, um, uh, a larger book, this chapter into a larger book. And I said, I don't want to do that because I, I want to put this behind me and I, want, I, I don't want to be a victim all the time. So I had this other idea for writing a book about art and physics, and and you know I was told, well you know you're not an art historian and you're not a, a physicist, and then um, the book I had a, a literary agent come up to me at the end of a, a, a talk that I was giving, and he said, do you have this written down? And I said, well you know yeah, but he says I'd like to represent you, and then he took it back to New York and there was nine, a bidding war for. This is for, the first book, The Art of Physics, yeah. yeah. So there was just uh, an incredible interest So, in it. So it, it just came naturally you, to you to write, or let's talk about this, because your books are very well researched, yeah. but, but you use what you find in the books and as a platform to take it to a new level. Correct. So, 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 what what is involved in that kind of writing? A, a lot of reading, obviously, but then does it just sort of come out as you see connections that others don't? You know, I, I see patterns. Mm -hmm. um, I see patterns where um, not many other people see patterns. They they don't see them, and I I see. I think that's what made me a good surgeon. And now this is what's making me a good writer, in that I ask, you know, I used to be a very annoying student because I was always asking questions. And the questions I asked were unusual questions. And, you know, the, the three books that I've written, the, the first one is, you know, that the artist anticipated every idea in modern physics using an image and metaphor prior to their expression in numbers and equations. And all of those, um, um, you know, because it's usually said that, well, the physicist comes first, but I, I maintain that this was the artist. And, and this is about right brain, left brain. So then I was going to write a sequel to that, um, and then I went on a... Um, 
archaeological tour of the Mediterranean uh, sites, and we had this University of Athens professor who was telling us um, that, you know, this temple was dedicated to a goddess and then uh, it changed to a god. And, and I thought, well, that's kind of really strange. And I looked back at the ancient world and saw that all these civilizations worshipped the goddess, and then these three Abrahamic religions denied the existence of a goddess. You know, Eve and Mary, and you know, they were all demoted. So, <laughs> um, so I thought that that was kind of strange, mm -hmm. and and I concluded that it was the invention of the alphabet, that, that reading and writing is different than speaking and listening. You know, speaking and listening is a right brain, left brain activity, but reading and writing is a left brain activity. Mm -hmm. So that by switching into this patriarchal, uh, masculine mode of thinking, the women's rights were diminished and um, the goddess disappeared and these three religions emerged Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And, um, and the one time in Western culture is when literacy uh, was lost, was in the Dark Ages, and everybody went back to worshiping Mary. And you have to ask, well, <laughs> I mean, you see. have to ask, well, yeah. well where, where did Mary come from? Because she's mentioned only eight times in the synoptic mm. uh, gospels, mm -hmm. and she's a peripheral character in the story, and then suddenly she's mm -hmm. all over the place. And then the Protestants come back with, you know, when literacy starts rising again, and they say, we, we want to reform this religion, we want to get rid of Mary, mm -hmm. you know, and we want to, uh, uh, so, so, so there's been a, I, I trace the um, the um, uh, uh, course of uh, the um, uh, the course of women's rights and and the goddess um, throughout history. And now I I propose presently that because of the enormous amount of images that we're bombarded with, which are mainly a right brain function. Mm -hmm. that we're, we're leaving 5,000 years of text and we're moving into the iconic age, which is about the image. And that's why women's rights are rising. I mean, my wife is a judge and, um, you know, she, there were no women judges 100 years ago. And, and all, you know, I, I train um, surgeons at UCSF and over 50% of the surgical residents mm -hmm. are now women, mm -hmm. which would have unhe been unheard of uh, 100 years ago. So, uh, so, so, yeah, can I just ask you, the, sure. on, so you, you're, you're basically, obviously like the second book that you were just talking about where you, you focused on, hey, what happened to women in, in, the, in the rise of Western civilization? Now, the, in doing that research, in doing that book, when we when you look at your bibliography, you then read everything. But you're also being affected by the times, right? right. That the book is a product of a new sensibility. Right. Uh, uh, so that's also at work here in in generating these ideas. Is, that's correct. That's correct. I mean, yeah. absolutely. And, and and you know, as a result of writing that book, I was. Um, you know, criticized by, mainly by people who hadn't read it. They said, well, surely you're not uh, saying that literacy caused uh, this profound change. And, you know, you could find um, non-literate tribes that mistreat women. So I started to ask myself, why is it that we humans, of the three million sexually reproducing species, don't mate in the way that everybody else mates, mm -hmm. and that and that the women don't have estrus, you know, and they don't uh, they have menses, and uh, and they're available uh, for sex all year round, you know, whereas the other animals are not. So that led me to write this third book, which is about evolution and how we evolved. Uh, into um, 
where we are today, and that's um, um, Sex, Time, and Power. So, Which is your third book. So I've written three books that are all different. They're, you, know, they, you couldn't get three more different books. Uh, they all have a theme of right brain, left brain, but they're, they're, uh, they're, they're three different books, and they're all national bestsellers. And then it occurred to me that <coughs> a book about Leonardo's brain would combine all these three books. And why is that? And Leonardo was this extraordinary figure who I wrote about in um, Art and Physics. But I used his brain because he was so exceptional. You know, if you were to design a Nobel Prize committee that gave out only two awards, one in art and one in science, and we opened up the competition to the entire world, and I think just think of all the people who would have won the art award, and then think of all the people who would have won the science award. Who can you name who could have won the award in both categories? Mm -hmm. And you'd be hard pressed to come up with five or six candidates. Mm -hmm. But after a while, you'd have to think, well, you know, the, 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 their, their contribution to the uh, opposite side uh, uh, is not quite world class. So the only person that would win it in all categories mm. is uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So, so I wanted to understand how was his brain wired? I mean, wh wh what kind of brain did he have? Well, for one thing, he was gay. For one thing, he was illegitimate. For one thing, he was, uh, for another thing, he was um, uh, left-handed, but ambidextrous. Uh, he was a vegetarian. He, he, he refused <laughs> to eat meat, and when you asked him why, he said, because I don't want to harm any other animal. So he had a very global um, mindset in the and time. And a when, modern sensibility. Yeah, a, a modern. He could take up residence in the Bay Area. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, and, and I, I've, um, I, 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 I've just developed this theme of right brain, left brain, and where we're going with this. And I'm postulating that, you know, we're a species that's only 150,000 years old. And most species live to be a million to a million two before they either go extinct or they become something else. So we're about 10 or 12 years old. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and we can manifest that because you know, look, look, look we're, we're starting to harm each other. We're starting to, you know, that this is the age when a child becomes uh, uh, more mature. But at the same time, we're also achieving a maturity. So um, I'm, writing, I'm writing the last chapter now, and it's, it's um, uh, I think this book is going to be Terrific. And, and it, it, or, or, it, it, what excites you? I mean, is it, because you, you've used this word, uh, uh, reconfiguring the brain, rewiring the brain. And, and obviously, in talking about your own life, you've, you've actually been there right. and thought about it and, and so on. And so, so what, because this is, you're, you're suggesting that we're going to go to new plateaus that we can't even anticipate yet. Exactly. And it sounds like it's going to involve rewiring and then the, the, the use of technology to take us to these places. You know, there's three million species of sexually reproducing species. Mm -hmm. They're all based on the carbon benzene ring. And then humans came along and we invented language. And language was the first entity organism that didn't need a physical body because all of us depend on language. We have a symbiotic relationship with it. We all depend on language, but language is an entity that depends on us. And it can't exist without us, and we can't exist without mm -hmm. it. So, so what's happened now is 
The other common element in the world is silicon dioxide. And silicon dioxide forms, you know, sand and glass. And so what's happened is that as a result of silicon dioxide being um, impressed into bodies as insulin pumps and defibrillators mm. and at what point are we cyborgs? I mean, at what point mm. are, you know, is all this machinery that we're putting inside of ourselves that's adding to our um, health, mm -hmm. uh, at what point is that making us a cyborg? And then mm. the use of transistors has aided us in the communication across the world, the internet and, and um, computers and uh, all of this is now bringing us, and we're becoming a different species. Mm -hmm. So we're making a transition that no one could have expected. Uh, who could have anticipated when we first got computers that there'd be the internet? I mean, it just, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, now you're, you're in, in your work, as I understand your work and in our conversation, uh, you are a person who has insights about what brings the humanities together with the sciences and and in in the sense because you're you're saying it's physics and art in a way and and the, the, that they're talking to each other well the fact of the matter is they often don't know that they're, they're talking to each other they, they don't, so not, so they're usually not talking yeah, to each other so so what how how is is that going to happen? You know that that in other words, the, the the very positive future that that you're suggesting will happen when we're actually when we're down here on Earth, living in a world in which the humanities and science don't talk, which we're oblivious to our own history, we're uh, oblivious often to the power relations that define the world that that we're actually living. Well, we have a, a trend to specialize in knowledge because knowledge is becoming so specialized that each person is, you know, um, seeking out a different little um, keyhole that they're going to um, specialize in. And I'm a synthesizer. I'm, I'm trying mm -hmm. to say, you know, this is not the way to go. I mean, we need to synthesize uh, more uh, of the relationships between uh, artists and scientists and men and, and women and men and women and and uh, and and Leonardo best you know he he sort of managed to um, achieve that so um, so it's um, it's a uh, a book about um, trying to bring it all together mm -hmm. now you strike me as someone who can really help us think about creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at your work, you know, you're not a specialist on some of the fields right. that you've written about. You've taken criticism for that. But it's clear that one has to think out of the box right. in order to move this, this human enterprise forward. Talk a little about that. I mean, what is it about creativity that we have to get a handle on so that it's not lost in the context of the missile silos where we develop new knowledge? Creativity is a result of two, um, of two instincts. One is lust and the other one is danger. So, you know, all animals are equipped with a means to tell the difference when something in the environment has changed. And it usually means it's about to eat you. So, so, <laughs> so you, you, have to be, you have to be very alert. So, so danger is one of the um, um, uh, basis of creativity. The other one is lust because of the three million species of uh, animals, we're the only one that has um, decided that beauty, health, and, uh, and youth shall be the criteria 
that we will want to mate with somebody. Mm -hmm. And you know, men don't get uh, erections uh, unless women are healthy, young, and beautiful. And other animals... With the definition of beauty changing over yes. time. And, but other men, uh, I mean, other animals uh, don't have this problem. I mean, you know, they, they, they usually respond to pheromones. Uh, you know, you don't see a dog going around to the front of the dog and looking to see whether she's good looking, you know, <laughs> before, before, uh, before doing something with her. So, so uh, this was a very unusual factor that we ended up, um, uh, that, 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 that creativity, which emerged later, came from these three things, health, youth, and beauty. So, so then we became the only animal that roamed the world. I mean, there's no other animal that doesn't have a flyway or a, you know, a, a migratory path or, you know, we go everywhere. So we needed something to change the way we thought about when we were in uh, an environment that would be healthy. So we, we morphed this um, sense of beauty into um, the sense of beauty of natural beauty. I mean, we're, you know, we're the only animal that, you know, that really um, gets taken by beauty. I mean, you don't see other animals going, wow, look at that, you know, some chimpanzees and other, and Jane Goodall has identified some activity of that, but you know, you don't see the chimpanzees rearrange their, their um, housing, you know, so, so we moved it over to include um, natural beauty, and then we moved it over hmm. to become artifactual beauty. And we started making things with our hands that were beautiful. And you know, th th there, there's a 250,000-year-old um, bifacial hand axe. And in the center of this bifacial hand axe, is a very carefully preserved um, sh seashell, fossil shell. So you have to wonder, you think to yourself, well, what, what were they thinking? Why, why did they preserve this shell? Because it was beautiful. So we know that this was something that came a long time ago, and we've, we've now shifted this to be the creative impulse. And the creative impulse is dependent upon, based on lust and danger. Mm -hmm. Now, look, we're we're in in times that uh, with we have a new president. We're we're uh, we're at the peak of what technology can give us. So it's a it's a it it really offers great possibility. But in 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 the history. Uh, and some of which you cover in your books. I mean, power does things to the, you know, power corrupts, it corrupts absolutely, and that it, it can uh, uh, derail the possibilities that, that we might be in, in reach of. Talk, talk a little about that. I mean, does, do, do I, you, you obviously are, are very sensitive to, to the brain, the mind, to, to biological factors that determine our existence, but the beside language and art, you know, in our relations we produce power. T right. Talk a little about that, and how does that enter into your analysis? I, I, I think that the human species is on its way to extinction uh, because, number one, we objectify nature our language allows us to objectify nature, which means that we're not part of it. So we can say, oh, that's nature over there, and we can destroy it. So we're destroying our natural habitat. In addition to which, we're the only animal that engages in war. I mean, chimpanzees have been known to do that, but no other animal. They have dominance fights that usually don't result in death, but a large-scale killing of other members, uh, unheard of. And we have um, a problem in that because we stood up 
um, we positioned our uh, intestines directly above our anus, which made a problem because it, 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 in order to support the intestines, the, the pelvic um, hole had, had to diminish and it shrunk. And as a result, the baby's brain kept getting bigger and the pelvis kept getting smaller and we're the only animal that has a high degree of maternal mortality rate. So women began having a terrible time having their babies and, they, and it's been estimated that uh, according to primate um, uh, gestational periods that a woman should be pregnant for 18 months but she can only be not a week beyond nine otherwise she may die or the baby will die. So we bring the babies very immature into the world and the saving grace is that we've developed language so that we can hold the cult in a culture all the information that the baby needs and then we got to socialize them. But it contains a error and that is that by socializing the people so long they can acquire dangerous belief systems that are not true. And, and these belief systems we see all over the world right now are um, part of uh, a um, process that is, uh, you know, in instituting war. So, um, so war and, um, and objectifying nature. And then the third thing is that we're the only animal that doesn't know when to stop breeding. I mean, all other animals have an intuitive, instinctive kind of knowledge that they're 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 challenging the environment by you know so they'll they'll, they'll automatically start diminishing their um, brood, but we don't have that. So overpopulation and um, uh, the war and uh, the objectification of nature are the three things that will do us in. However, we also are at a stage where we can change. And that's why I'm, uh, uh, the, the changes that have been in the universe so far have been so unexpected that if you were to be a observer, you would have never have anticipated that, you know, uh, the DNA molecule would form out of amino acid or, you know, that the stars would turn on from atoms that were so tiny, you know, that, the, you know, just think of it. You, we have two stories of the um, creation. One is about a creator that creates the story, uh, the world in seven day, six days and rests on the seventh. And the other one is about a big bang that happened out of nothing 13 billion years ago, which is, mm -hmm. which is more unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> but, but we now know that the science thing is pretty solid. And, um, and um, you know, it's been proven or proven what the, 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 this long story of 13 billion years ago uh, makes more sense than the other story. I, I guess uh, also another hope is always the next generation. I, I you know I know you're a, a, a proud parent of four children, and I'm sure you have grandchildren. Absolutely. So 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 that that is also uh, 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 a place where our humanity will move us forward. Well, I, I'm I'm very encouraged by. Um, these two trends. The, the, the one trend, you know, if you think about the Renaissance, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm immersed in the Renaissance right now, and, and during Leonardo's lifetime, when he was a baby, the printing press was invented, and the printing press transformed the world because there were uh, 8,000 books circulating, uh, not circulating, and either they were in private collections or behind, a locked church um, uh, doors, and then uh, these 8,000 books became 15 million in the space of 40 years. So 
the society was transformed. So the society moved mm -hmm. way to the left. And then the re that started the Reformation. And the Reformation said, no, no, no laughing, no, no, uh, no sex, no, uh, um, uh, and, and what the Reformate, what the Renaissance was about was about new clothes, new dances, new music, a new attitude towards sexuality, a new humanistic a attitude. And, and Protestantism was, you know, no, you, you, you're dressing only in black and white and no dancing. And, and then the religious wars started. And the religious wars lasted 200 years. And then the Enlightenment occurred. Well, what's happened in the 50s was television. And television transformed the world. And television um, produced a huge shift to the left with new dances, new music, new, new clothes, and a new attitude towards sexuality and a new you know, humanism. And that produced the Reformation of the 90s, which were all these uh, evangelicals and, and uh, people being, you know, okay, no, 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 we're not going to have any of this. And now we're, we're into the religious wars with the being attacked from the, the jihadists and at the same time being attacked by our evangelical base that want to change the rules about everything. Well, does Obama represent um, the new generation, the Enlightenment? I mean, I think so. Because mm -hmm. everything is speeded up uh, in, in our um, culture from the Renaissance. So instead of it taking 200 years, it's taking 30 years. And, and we're, we're witnessing um, what I think is, um, is a pretty dramatic um, change. One final question. We have only a few minutes left. What, how would you advise students to prepare for the future? Um, I would prepare, I, how would I advise students to prepare for the future? Well, let me think about that. Um, I, I think you have to have a very global view. Um, you, you know, most students are are, are concentrating, and I did it too. You know, you you're concentrating on a narrower and narrower field of expertise, and that that process should go on like that. But then there comes a time in your life when you want to expand, <coughs> and you don't you, you you want to enlarge your view. So I don't know that I could advise students to do that when they're concentrating on gaining a skill that's a very narrow area. But there has to come a time in their life when after they've acquired that skill, then they open up. And unfortunately, you know, you're in college and you're, you're studying all these courses, and then afterwards you don't study those courses. But you need those courses after, <laughs> after you're in midlife. Uh, on that note, uh, Dr. Schlein, I want to thank you very much for being with us, and I'm going to take a moment to show your three books to our audience, Art and Physics, uh, Sex, Time, and Power, and uh, The Alphabet versus uh, The Goddess. And I can't show yet, but when you come back to be on our program, when your book comes out, we'll show your new book on Leonardo da Vinci. Thank you very much for taking the time I, to be here. My pleasure. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.